What's up and welcome to another episode of the Grindline Podcast. You're listening to episode 185. I am here tonight with Tyler, but also with NHL content creator from YouTube, O Nyquist. Uh, great to have you on. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing good. How are you guys? Thanks for having me. Oh, it's it's been a week, man. It, we've hit again the slow period of no news besides the crazy contracts that are currently being handed out by the Florida Panthers. Oh, but, yeah. tell me about it yeah but it's i mean it's it's good i mean rain just a ton of rain in michigan and tyler is is out in boston so they've got some good news today right tyler well not that i care about but the, the people <laughs> around here certainly do care about and I, I i don't know it's kind of mixed feelings i know some people are like well you know we should just hit the reset button and, and start from scratch and not bring these old guys back but like then there's people that are just like, oh, well, we can run it back and it could be like 2011. And it's like 2011 was 10 years ago <laughs> or 11 years ago. Sorry. So but uh, no, I'm doing good. We're melting here. It's been like 90 degrees for like eight days straight or something. Tomorrow it's finally supposed to break. So and you're way out west, right? Western Canada. I'm in eastern Canada. Eastern Canada. Oh, Halifax. Yep. Awesome. Our weather. It's been really hot here, too. Honestly, it's hot Awful. everywhere, man. It's been terrible. Um, but tonight we're got a lot to talk about. We want to get a little bit of uh, content creator background and assessment of the Iser plan predictions for the wings. You cover the entire league, so you got yeah. your, your foot in the door of almost every team. But first, I want to kind of give the, maybe the people who haven't seen your stuff, and I mean, that's probably not going to be anyone we talk to, but uh, <laughs> just kind of a bit of background on how you got started, what you've been doing, uh, how, how you came to, to enjoy the sport, just, just a little bit about you. Well, it's, it's a funny story how we got started. Um, I think it was in 2015 or 2016. I was like 15 or 16. And me and a bunch of my friends, we uh, we played a lot of Call of Duty back in the day. And uh, everyone would come over to my house. They'd all bring their PlayStations. And we'd all sit in one room and just play for hours. And one day, we just all decided at the same time to make YouTube channels. But actually, my plan, I didn't know I'd be doing, you know, content about the nhl we started just by uploading call of duty videos that weren't very good um but yeah that didn't last very long because nobody watched them except us and uh yeah that's pretty much how it got started i was really the only one that kept going but and how did you get into just nhl stuff in general um i was just trying to because i find sometimes when you if you start a youtube channel and you're uploading like say one thing will be about basketball and then you know a call of duty video then a hockey video like it's too all over the place you kind of get to find one thing to be consistent with. And um, for me, that was just the NHL because that was my main sport my whole life. I feel like it's the sport I've been most knowledgeable about my knowledgeable about my whole life as well. So yeah, I just decided it was probably best. And they got the most views too, because I feel like there wasn't really a lot of people doing it at the time. No, I think it kind of NHL stuff. And especially I feel like on YouTube and on social, if you go back, like we started our podcast uh, right as the Red Wings fell off a cliff or started to fall off a cliff. Yeah. And I feel oh, like, I, well, well, Greg, I don't mean to cut you off, but I, when, when I was doing it, when it was still a part of the blog, the winged octopus, yeah. it was right before that first, the first playoff series against Tampa. And then, yeah, you're right. I mean, then they yeah. lost in five games and then, you know, everything kind of went to shit. So. The, the Holland exit strategy is where we started, <laughs> but yeah, it's a rough it, time. It, rough yeah, time. it feels like that that was kind of though around the kind of almost like the huge surge in in content creation for hockey stuff. I know that uh, one of the other podcasts uh, in the area started a, a few years before us, right when like the decline when you could see it on the horizon. But yeah. now that we're coming back to like happy times in Detroit, it's going to be weird to have a podcast and have positive stuff to talk about. And be able to make like really good positive content around hockey because we haven't really been able to do that. I mean, there's been bits and pieces here and there, but not really, not really anything else to to write home about. Uh, how did you get your name? Yeah, a lot of people ask me this. I honestly, I don't know where the O came from, but uh, back in like 2014, 2015, like Nyquist was one of the more you know exciting younger guys on the Red Wings. He was kind of in that like bridge area between like the current era of Red Wings and like. Datsuk and Zetterberg in that era. Yep. So yeah, he was a guy I was always a pretty big fan of. So, and a lot of people wondered if I changed my name when he got traded, but I just decided not to. Yeah. So are the Wings your favorite team? Yeah, definitely. 
How long have you been following the wings? Uh, basically for as long as I can remember. And I think it's pretty random too, because most of my family are Maple Leafs fans, but the first hockey game I ever watched, I think I was like six or seven and it was the Red Wings and Oilers game. And I just chose one team to cheer for. And I guess I just stuck with it. So you're like the Larkins then. Yeah. Larkin is a, a Red Wings fan in a Maple Leafs household. His dad's a huge Leafs fan. Yep, that's exactly so, it. It's kind of uh, cool how it works in terms of like, I mean, I know the Wings and, and you know, teams like Chicago and, and Toronto and stuff like that have fans everywhere. But like, you know, you're in the eastern part of Canada. I'm in Massachusetts, but, you know, I, I do have some Michigan ties. But besides that, like, we still both are Red Wings fans. It's, it's kind of cool how that works out. <laughs> Yeah, there's not many Red Wings fans around here in Nova Scotia, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot no, of there's it... some Bruins fans though, isn't there? Because when, whenever oh, yeah. I go to like a random Bruins game, you run into people from Canada and they're like, "Yeah, we're from Nova Scotia. We drove down. We're Bruins fans." I'm like, "What?" Yeah, some of that might come from Brad Marchand being from Nova Scotia. Uh, true. Yeah, you get a lot of Penguins fans and Avalanche fans because that too, because of Crosby, McKinnon, yeah, Cole Harbor, yeah. Yeah. So with the wings, as you know, Steve Eiserman has made several moves this off season. And I mean, to his credit and always to his credit, I mean, generally positive. I wouldn't say anything negative. The only thing people really had to complain about was the Sherratt contract, not much of the player himself, but the contract. And according to Dom Lucision from the athletic, the wings had the highest uh, possible win ads this off season with six I think the next person in our uh, division was Ottawa with a possible 3.7 wins based on bringing in guys like Debrinket. I kind of want to get your assessment of the Iser plan so far, kind of uh, moves that have, have shocked you, moves that, that you really like, and just how you think that, that the rebuild is going overall. Well, I, like you said, I feel like even not just like within Red Wings fans, but like league wide, I feel like pretty much everything Steve Osmond has done since being Red Wings GM has been like, positively received um with the exception of a couple like the perlini trade was obviously a wash um i remember there was a lot of people that were kind of skeptical about the nick letty trade but obviously it kind of worked out because they got a sizable return for him at the deadline but uh my favorite movie of the offseason i would say is the, actually the david perron co- signing it really caught me off guard too but i think it's fantastic value for a guy who scored at like a 25 plus goal pace for the past four seasons yeah um, a guy who was a right shot forward, which Detroit lacks, and he should definitely come in and help the power play, which is another area that has been, you know, pretty scarce over the past couple of seasons. But overall, I would say, yeah, very good off season. Like you said, the Chirac contract, it is what it is. But I feel like when your team with as much cap space as the Red Wings have, and obviously you, you have to overpay for guys in free agency. That's just how it works, especially with defensemen. And it's not like the market for defensemen this offseason was huge either. Patrat was, you know, one of the bigger name guys available. So, yeah, looking at it going into next season, too, I mean, you have a bunch of UFAs coming up and money's not really going to be an issue. Pia Suter will come off the books and I'm not sure they bring him back. I could see them bringing Oscar Sunquist back. He brings that kind of grit to the, the bottom six in a bigger body. Adam Ernie is most definitely not coming back. Uh, Giovanni Smith's an ARB eligible RFA next season. I don't really see much of a reason to bring him. So you've got a bunch of cap coming in. So giving that deal, we had talked about it, giving that 4.75 to Sherratt for four years, next season, it's not going to matter. Even this season doesn't matter. We still have $10.2 million to spend if we wanted to. So um, the eyes are planned now. Do you think it's ahead of schedule from where, from him first coming in to where maybe you saw it going? I would say for sure. I think, uh, like, honestly, say if um, Raymond and Sider didn't, or I mean, all, everyone expected Sider to make the team yep. uh, coming into this past season, but say he didn't have as big of an impact as he did um, and say Raymond maybe spent a year in the American Hockey League. I, if that happened, I don't think we would have seen Steve Eisman go out and spend as much money as he did in free agency this year and uh, be as active, not just getting like warm bodies, but actually getting guys that are going to move the needle and put the Red Wings closer to playoff contention. So I would definitely say like Raymond and Sider doing what they did, put the rebuild a little bit ahead of schedule for sure. Yeah, yeah. and that's what it needed to. It, it needed to to kind of get going because I think people people weren't starting to get restless yet, but you could just kind of see that on the horizon of people starting to say, you know what, like it, this is taking a little bit longer than – than what we thought it was going to be, even though us as like, you know, followers of the team and us as, you know, fans of the team, like 
we knew it was going to be five to seven years before they were actually good. And I think you make a good point with the Raymond and Cider thing is I think if they might have been, if they might have had cool seasons where say maybe Cider got two thirds of, of the points that he got and, and Raymond maybe had 20 goals and, and maybe 25 assists or 20 assists. Maybe he doesn't go out in, in sign six guys, seven guys. Maybe he slows it down a little bit, but I think to, to what you said, him going out and making these splashes is partially reflective on how good of a season the rookies had. I mean, Mo winning the Calder, Raymond coming in fourth for Calder voting, making the rookie all-star team. That's all really big stuff. Like I said, stuff for us to be excited about because what have, what have we had previously besides Dylan Larkin? Exactly, and, yeah. and again, Larkin having a career year. That's another big part of it too. Larkin showing that he can lock down that 1C position, pushing toward elite, and then hopefully coming back from the core surgery and being 100% healthy and, and just leading the team going forward. I think starting with that core, and I'm not sure how you feel about a, a Bertuzzi signing impending, but that too, it's just showing that Iserman sees, Iserman's playing chess while everyone else is playing checkers. That's what's happening. And Iserman sees these pieces falling into place and says, yes, I, I think going forward, I can make a push. And then maybe even more come the latter half of next season, maybe post all-star break, we're really looking good. And maybe some other moves are made too. So I think I would agree there that the, that it's a little bit ahead of schedule. I'm not sure how much, but I think when he initially, when Iserman initially came in, I think we had said three or four years to playoffs and then around seven seasons until you're actually contending for a cup. And I think we're still on track for that. Oh yeah, for sure. Another thing I would say is Larkin, you know, his contract being up at the end of next season, I think um, going out and signing all the players that he did this off season, that shows Larkin that, you know, Steve Osmond isn't complacent. Yeah, sure. It's like a Connor Bedard draft, but obviously he has no intentions of going after that number one overall pick, you know, barring a bunch yeah. of season long injuries and stuff like that. Yeah. I think uh, Iserman had mentioned it a few times. He said he wanted to show the younger guy, younger, but older on the team guys like Larkin, like a Hronik, like a Bertuzzi that he's not going to let this team roll over and lose. He's going to make this team better. He's going to help them get pieces around them to win because we saw what pieces around Larkin. I mean, Lucas Ray Larkin and Raymond have amazing chemistry. It was great what uh, Larkin was able to do with Raymond in his first season. And just to be able to go in and get those other pieces like Perron. Perron, like you said, is, is a great add. But I think even more to the fact that his leadership ability is phenomenal. His, his kind of ruggedness and toughness is great. And I think Perron, and especially how pissed off he's going to be at St. Louis, he's, he's going to have a chip on his shoulder to come in and kind of prove a little bit more than, than maybe he did last season and help out the power play. A guy like Andrew Kopp, who Larkin's familiar with, is going to come in and solidify your second line center position. So Iserman has faith in the younger guys and has shown he wants to do stuff to help them. Yeah, for sure. Another signing I really liked and I think could be kind of sneaky good is Dominic Kubalik. I mean, yeah. it's a guy who scored 30 goals the season before last. He's another guy who I think can help on the power play, probably not the first unit, but actually make that second unit a threat, which it hasn't been at all for the past couple of seasons. Like I'm sure you guys would be in the same boat as me to watch the power play and then just sigh when the first unit goes off the ice because you know <laughs> nothing is going to happen. You also don't know what the second unit is going to be on a night to night basis. Exactly. Sometimes you have Adam Ernie on it, Sam Gagne. <laughs> Sometimes you had Adam Ernie in the top six. Which yeah, uh, again, I, so I assume you're happy with us. the coaching change. Oh yeah, for sure. I, I mean, it had to happen. What do you think of Lalone? Um, I feel like it's kind of hard to gauge like coaches. You kind of just got to wait and see the results. But I mean, he's obviously pretty decorated. He won a lot with Tampa Bay. Um, so he obviously has a relationship with Steve Eisman as well. So I think, uh, I think it's only up from here when it comes to coaching, especially. I agree. Tyler was very happy that uh, that Jeff Blaschel has gone. Yes, yes, I am. I am very excited that that there's a there's a fresh start, a fresh face behind the bench. I think it was needed. And then going back to what you said about Kubalik, um, I saw I see a lot of people like mocking like you know the opening night roster, and they have him on the fourth line, and some have him like scratched. I'm like, 
Are yeah. you kidding me? Like he's not a fourth line player. I know he's a bigger guy, but he's not a fourth line player. He's a third line player. And, and on some teams, he could probably be a second line player on, you know, a bottom two or three team in the NHL. So, yeah, I think getting him out of the quicksand that was the Chicago Blackhawks. And then mm. even more so now, since what the Blackhawks have done recently by literally selling their entire team. Um, I, and, and I had posed the question, out on Twitter, I did a poll. Like, do you think Kubalik is going to refine his offense? And uh, what do you have his goals at? And I mean, it was an overwhelming yes response. Of course, he's going to do better offensively in a team that's going to put him in a better position. He'll probably get second power play unit and he'll get more time to produce. But I I don't think it's, it's off to expect 20 to 25 goals out of Kubelik given the circumstances and given the guys who you're going to be able to surround him with, because what was your second line last season is going to basically move down to your third line. And your second line was not bad last season. Your bottom six was horrendous, but your top six was pretty good. And in giving Kubelik guys like a, a Pia Suter is a good setup guy. Pia Suter was an actually a good player last season. And to give Kubalik a guy like Pia Suter and maybe a winger in Zadina, I think it could spark his offense again. All right, that's a very intriguing third line, Suter, Zadina, and Kubalik. Maybe uh, Kubalik's a Czech player as well, isn't he? I believe. Um, yeah. I think so. Yeah, yeah so yeah. maybe yep, Zadina him can find that Czech connection kind of like he did with Verona. Um, but yeah, I mean, like the team is just so much deeper, especially on the left side. Um, in terms of the left wingers, like when Robbie Fabry comes back, like that's a guy who might be on the fourth line, like either him or Kubelik, right? <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, so the left side especially is very, very deep. Well, I think that also brings us to some like trade pieces too, because if you look, we have a glut of forwards and not a ton of forward space, especially when you're trying to fit in in rookies. So if, if Bergeron needs a spot, a guy's got to go. When Fabry comes back, a guy's got to go. I had said Pia Suter could be on the trade block. If someone offers you a boatload for Jacob Verana, do you trade him? If someone offers you something really, really good for Tyler Bertuzzi, I'm not sure he's not going to go to a Canadian team because of the, the border issues and he's going to miss more games than he plays. But he's a UFA. Uh, he'd be a rental unless you extended him and then traded him or he agreed to an extension. I think... Iserman still has moves to make because of the pieces there be just too many pieces up front yeah exactly um it just it opens up a lot of options like you said and I mean obviously having too many good players is a lot better of a problem to have than not enough good players which yeah. is what we've been used to for a long time so yeah like you said I mean if Bergen comes in and just makes it and plays so well that they can't keep him off the team kind of like what Lucas Raymond did then yeah it's definitely it's going to bump some NHL caliber players out of the lineup and uh, potentially open up some trade possibilities. How do you guys feel about Tyler Bertuzzi? Do you, do you want him to stick around? You can go first, Tyler. I'm yeah. Split, so but... I'm, I like Bertuzzi. I kind of am in the same camp as Greg though. I think when, when the wings are going to need a player like him, I think he's going to be a little bit too old. Like I, I think you can sell high on him now. Um, and if you were to trade him, you could probably get a decent, decent haul back. Um, I think when, I think he's just a little bit too early. Like, I think he's, what is he? 26, 27 20, now. He, he'll be 27. I believe so he might be 27 be, already. He might be 20. Right. Okay. So by the time the wings are ready to contend for, a, a, you know, a Stanley cup where you need tougher players, um, you know, he might already be over the hill by then. So that's why I think it, it would behoove them to trade him now and see what you can get for him. Yeah, we have uh, I have been accused of being a Bertuzzi hater only because I think his value is so high now that it, it's almost if you don't think you're going to be making a playoff push in the next, let's say he's 27 in the next four seasons, like a legitimate playoff push. Bertuzzi plays the style of game like a Brad Marchand where it's heavy hitting. You, you go to the corners, you're digging out pucks, you're taking more hits. So you, you may deteriorate faster. He's already had back surgery and it's, I mean, it's a little iffy to me and it's not the vaccine thing. I could care less that, that, I mean, I'm not super happy. He missed nine games, 
but I don't think his value is ever going to be much higher than what it is now. So I'm more on the sell high train and my hope, and I've said this before, is that a guy like Carter Mazur, if he continues to develop the way he's developing, can be that next Tyler Bertuzzi in that playoff window because he plays the same style game that Bertuzzi plays. And he showed last season that he's got that offensive talent that can develop. So I think if you could get a first round pick plus for Bertuzzi, I think if you could trade Bertuzzi, whether alone or in a package for a Matt Barzal, it's worth doing right now because I'm not sure his trade value is going to be higher than what it is currently. The one thing I also want to say about Bertuzzi, I hate to bring up the vaccination thing, but like, and and I'm not going to get political or anything, but I, I just think that to have a team of, of players that are all bought in and then you have one guy that can't travel to a country in which there's seven teams now in Canada. And DMAC said the same thing. It's a team thing. It's a team thing. It's not, it's not a political thing. So for me, it's a team thing. And then for me, it's just like, could you trade him away, get another player back that is going to be a part of those games? I guess that's my my main thing. Yeah, and I mean, I especially agree with you on, uh, Greg, what you said about the weight, the style Tyler Bertuzzi plays. Like, I don't think he's a guy whose game is going to age, like, really well. Mm-hmm. Um, like I said, he's had back problems. He plays that tough style. And yeah, I also the whole vaccine thing. I mean, that couldn't have pleased Steve Eisenman um, in the slightest, you know, having one of your best players, especially, you know, through those seasons where, you know, good forwards in the Red Wings were few and far between having that guy miss nine games. Um, definitely, definitely doesn't help. Yeah. I, and he'll, he'll say that it's, I mean, it, Eisenman is a man of very few words. He'll say it's his decision. We support Tyler Bertuzzi and everything. He said stuff like that before, and then two weeks later traded a guy. So Iserman does not show his hand at all. And and they could say that the guys in the room are happy with it too, but I the guys in the room probably aren't super happy when Bert's not there to score and they're down four goals playing against the Montreal Canadiens. Like that's they couldn't not... have been happy. They the players couldn't have been happy in those games in Montreal. I'll tell you that right yeah. now. Because for a team that was not very good, the Canadians, they destroyed the wings up in Montreal. Those were hard to watch. Matthew oh, Perot hat trick in one of them, didn't he? <laughs> oh, yeah. Ben Sherratt scored a goal. That was, those were rough games. Those games were over in the first period, both of oh, them. Oh, yeah. There was yeah. too many games like that. Oh. Um, remember the, the Arizona game? Like, oh. games like that, there's, there was too many. That's another reason why, like, I feel like a coaching change had to happen. I feel like the guys kind of just quit on Jeff Blaschel. If we get blown out at ASU, I am going to be so mad. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's, <laughs> um, that's so. So going into next season, uh, like we have been talking about, the Wings have a much better team. I mean, on paper, it's better. In the locker room, it's better. Coaching wise, it's better. I kind of wanted to get your predictions. Like, uh, what what do you see as the major improvements? Maybe where do you see room we still might have to improve? Uh, maybe some surprises. What do you see going forward next season? I would say, I mean, room to improve. Obviously, the blue line got better, but I mean, I think there's still a lot of room to improve there. Like, you don't really like Mortside is really the only horse on that blue line. Um, I'm not as high on Philip Ronick as some other Red Wings fans are. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, I'm actually kind of looking forward to him having a partner, maybe like an Oli Mata, who's very yep. defensively sound. Mm-hmm. Um, and then maybe that can unlock some aspects of Hronik's game. But I would say the blue line for sure. Um, I think in goal, honestly, they have the perfect tandem to kind of, you know, act as a placeholder um, for Sebastian Cosa until he's ready. Um, as far as predictions go, I don't think they're going to make the playoffs. I'm keeping my expectations in check. I mean, obviously, I want to be wrong, but really what I want to happen, I just want to be watching like games that actually mean something like past like Christmas, because that yep. usually just hasn't happened. Like, it'd be nice to say there's five games left in the season and maybe Detroit's like three or four points instead of a playoff spot. It'd be nice to watch games that are actually meaningful um, and the season not just being over, you know, three months into it, because I feel like especially in the Eastern Conference last season, we knew who was going to make the playoffs after like the first month of the season. Yeah, yep. the Wings like, had the Wings had that that stretch where they were playing good. Boston had a bunch of injuries, and then 
they couldn't capitalize on Boston having a bunch of injuries and they ended up, I think they had like a week off and Boston just started ripping off a bunch of wins in a row and they were done from there. Yep. And I'll, yeah, I mean, you guys mentioned it earlier uh, before we started recording the Bergeroning or might've been when we were recording the Bergeron yep. and Krejci signings. Yep. Obviously those don't help Detroit's playoff chances. Um, but I mean, I'm just looking forward to it being a lot more of an exciting season. The season not being over after a couple months. That's not, you know, trying to who's Detroit going to draft with this pick when it's in yeah. December, right? Yeah, well, we, we want to start talking about the draft. I, we started late this season because there was other stuff going on. But I want to start talking about the draft, like maybe when when the playoffs start, because I'm hoping the wings can be competitive up until like the last week of the season. But I mean, looking at the at the, at the Atlantic Division, Florida didn't help themselves very much. I mean, they got Kachuk, but they got rid of Huberdo and Uyghur. And I believe they're still over the cap, so they're going to have to make some more moves there. Yep. So I don't think 122 points for them next season is reasonable. Toronto's Toronto, whatever. Uh, Tampa signed some long contracts and didn't really improve themselves very much. Like you said, Boston got... uh, And they're a year older. And they're a year older, yeah. Boston got Krejci and Bergeron back. Uh, Buffalo has a bunch of young guys that are coming up that should be really good. And then there's us. Ottawa improved quite a bit, but I'm still not sold on them as a playoff team. And Montreal is a dumpster. So, I mean, the Atlantic's the Atlantic. It's probably the toughest division in hockey right now. I would say so, especially like, obviously Detroit got a lot better, but like you mentioned, yep. so did Ottawa. Yep. Um, They have the makings of being like their top six in terms of their forwards after adding Jeroen to bring it like. That's like one of the more exciting top sixes in the league, I feel like. So I think it's going to be Detroit and Ottawa fighting for that fifth spot. You never know, though. Boston, you know, we don't know how David Krejci is going to play after taking a year off. You know, Patrice Bergeron's a year older. And also, they have a lot of guys that are going to miss a lot of time to start mm-hmm. the season. Yeah. Um, I think Charlie McAvoy is one of them, Brad Marchand. So you never know. Like, very well, Ottawa or Detroit could end up finishing fourth in the Atlantic. I don't think that's out of the question at all. Yeah, I don't think so either. I said if, if Detroit makes the playoffs, it's going to be in one of the wild card positions. And I think that last season, Pittsburgh, no, uh, Washington took the low wild card with 100 points. And based on Jay Fresh's, I threw up the war roster builder. Based on his war roster builder, the Red Wings have a possibility of 101 points this season. So, I mean, in in the, in the uh, conference, that's that's right there i can't oh, yeah. see and then again how how far are the the teams in the metro gonna fall is pittsburgh gonna go down a bit is washington washington i don't see them getting 100 points next season so the islanders could get cadre so they were at 84 maybe they go up it all depends on what happens with the other teams too columbus got johnny gaudreau they're gonna get more so mm-hmm. it all depends on how they do too but i would not be shocked based on coaching and the additions because the Red Wings were, as we all know, in the wild card hunt up until the all-star break and in a position. And then the wheels fell off. So maybe they repeat that first half and then continue it um, with new coaching, with better players past that break. And that's, I think what we're all hoping for is just games where we're not getting blown out because it seemed like once a week, the Red Wings were getting blown out. And that's, I want to be, winning games by two goals i want to if we lose i want to lose by one i want to lose by two i don't want a nine to two game or an 11 to one game or whatever yeah there was way too many of those last year way too many of those um like what what was that the the stretch that they had that they gave up one goal two goal three and i think it was like one through ten or something like that where they had already given up that many goals in you know in a game that season it's just like they couldn't keep the puck out of their net and then they were down two nothing and everything would snowball and it's just not a good way to win hockey games or lose hockey games it's also not a good way to lose hockey games you're not wrong (laughs) uh so going i mean we still got some time uh training camp starts next month so there is about a month left until the prospect tournament and training camp but eiserman could still have a few moves up his sleeve 
we had talked about maybe there's a uh, possibility of an offer sheet coming. Maybe there's some teams. Now we do know there are teams that are cap strapped. They're going to have to make some trades and dump some salary. Do you see any maybe sneaky moves Iserman could make for the start of training camp? Um, I mean, I feel like with Steve Eisman, there's always a possibility that he's going to do something crazy. Um, it seems like he always has something up his sleeve, but I feel like with the fact that they still have over $10 million in cap space, even despite spending as much as he did this off season and with their teams being cap strapped, I think there's definitely room there to take on a bad contract here, there, get some draft picks, obviously similar to the one, um, the Mark Stahl trade a couple off seasons ago and Mark Stahl ended up being like a very serviceable defenseman on Detroit for a couple seasons as well. You could even call him well. good. Yeah. Well, I spent on Detroit. <laughs> yeah. He was entertaining. That's for sure. Pure chaos. Yep. Um, but, and then obviously with how many forwards Detroit has, I feel like there's always a possibility. Um, maybe if there's contract talks between Bertuzzi and the Red Wings and they don't get anywheres, then he can really start to consider moving him. Obviously Phillips Adina's name is always thrown around. Um, but yeah, I definitely think, uh, I would be surprised if something doesn't happen from now till the start of the season. I don't know how significant, but I definitely do see at least something happening. Uh, just given the position the Detroit Red Wings are in right now. Yeah. Given Zadina too, doesn't have a contract still. So yeah, I want to say, I forgot about that. Yeah, and he, I, still he didn't file signed. for arbitration. Did he? No, he think. did not. No, okay. uh, he's not arb eligible. Okay. Yeah, it was just Jake Wallman, right? Yeah, and Jake Wallman's uh, hearing is on the 11th, so it's coming up in a few days. Okay. Yeah, that's something I feel like no one's really talking about. I, yeah. I actually completely forgot he didn't have a contract still. <laughs> Me too, until I just looked at Cat Friendly. Uh, so yeah, Zadina needs a contract. I mean, what was his last contract? Let's see. Zadina's last contract was just base, so uh, it's AAV of 1.775. Uh, starting in 2018-19 last season, uh, 1.744. So it's he needs a contract. And I mean, I don't have an issue giving Zadina a contract that's maybe, and he still needs to prove it. So I think that's one of the questions we got was what's up with Zadina? <laughs> yeah, this is Zadina's future. future. Uh, it's from uh, Thomas Boric uh, off, um, your, off your channel. Yeah. And uh, I mean- well, What I kind like of contract Zadina. do you think Zadina- is going to end up signing. I feel like we could see him sign like one that Rasmussen signed a couple off seasons ago. What was it? Three years, one mil per or something like that. So Michael Rasmussen's was three years at 1.46. Okay. Yeah. So like I could see him getting something like that. And I think that would be totally fair. And definitely I, we're not going to be the Zadina haters. We like Philip Zadina. We exactly. think we want the best for him. Obviously we think Philip Zadina was not given a super fair shake by Jeff Blaschel. Uh, he mm -hmm. was tossed around lines too much, um, but he also needs to get out of his own head. A lot of Philip Zina's problem is he thinks he can be Alex Ovechkin and he can't. I mean, maybe he can in five years, but he's not going to sit in the OV office and just score goals. He's going to have to learn to go in tight and score. He's going to have to learn to find open ice and score. His possession metrics are fantastic most of the time. He was one of the top five possession players on the team last season. I yeah. think the next shoe to drop is either going to be well i mean the next shoe to drop is probably the wallman contract because right they're, they're going to be an arbitration yeah decide an arb yeah and, and so they'll they'll go from there but after that i think the next shoe to drop is going to be the larkin contract you extension. think so i do you don't think zadina will get done before that I mean, I guess there's a possibility, but I do think the Larkin contract is, is going to get done here soon. It seemed like it was close and then nothing happened. I wonder if the talks went off the rails or what happened. No idea. But I think Zadina could get done soon. I mean, I don't, like you said, if he gets that Rasmussen contract where he's around, I don't know, one and a half million for three seasons, and then I think a coaching change will do him really good. Then that just bridges him to his, uh, to ufa right i don't think so Zid people forget zadina's 22 that would take him to 25 he'd still be an rfa oh yeah right so I, that's the same thing that happened for a while pretty much yeah, yeah. I, that's the same thing that happens with rasmussen rasmussen's contract takes him up to 25 he's still an rfa in 2024 25 when it's up and i think that's the smart thing to do i mean if philip zadina if you give philip zadina a three-year contract and he comes in next season and he bumps his goal total up a little bit and he improves season over season. And maybe all Philip Zina is is a fourth line player. 
But if you can have a fourth line player or a third line player that can chip in offensively and you've got them for 1.5 million, is that really a problem? No, exactly. And I mean, we saw like Michael Rasmussen, he just, I wouldn't say it was like a breakout year, but I mean, he scored 15 goals. Like that's not nothing. No, he became a player this season. Yeah, that's exactly. I definitely he, think Zadine is capable of being in between 15 to 20 goals. At least. Oh, yep. A lot of people, um, you know, say the the term brick by brick. I think he started that brick process during that 2020 season. The, you know, the, um, I guess the COVID shortened season, the, the 56 game schedule. Who are you talking he about, Zadina or Rasmussen? Rasmussen. Okay. Rasmussen. Yeah, he was starting to build that towards the end of that season, and and he continued it into last year. I know he slowed down a little bit offensively, um, but he started to get it going. It always seems like he gets it going as the, as the season's getting ready to end. It's it's kind of kind of just like oh, I wish we could be in the playoffs to see exactly playoff Michael Rasmussen. I think he scored two goals in the last game of the season. Yeah, New Jersey, yeah, pretty did. sure. Yeah, Michael Rasmussen actually ended the season with. Um, uh, let's see. 80 games played, 15 goals, 12 assists for 27 points. His Corsi four, his Corsi and Fenwick numbers were ugh, 42.4 all around Corsi four and 43 Fenwick. So he's got to work on his possession. But I mean, he, like you said, he became a guy. He became like, like they would say, he became a guy. And uh, in, I think Iserman mentioned him a few times. He was mentioned in kind of the vein of, Michael Rasmussen has made himself a part of this team. And I even said to where I'm not including Rasmussen in any trade talks because he's the kind of bottom six piece you need. And if he can learn to park his ass in front of the net and just be Thomas Holmes from light, then that's really what you want out of a Michael Rasmussen. Exactly. And I'm, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I can't imagine many of the 15 goals he scored were on the power play. I'm guessing most of them were at even strength because he's still like when he was drafted, he was kind of, um, touted as being a power play specialist, but yeah. that really hasn't translated at all. But still, if you have a fourth, third liner that gets you, you know, 15 goals, 30 points a season, have him for like, you know, a contract like he's on. I mean, I think that's great value. Yeah, he he scored a resounding zero goals on the power play this season. <laughs> yeah, so exactly. <laughs> Imagine if he just sprinkles in a couple. Yeah. I mean, then you got a 20 goal score on your hands. Yeah, yeah. he only had two points on the power play and both obviously assists. Yeah, and Tyler brings it up all the time. Michael Rasmussen is never going to live up to his his selection spot. He is never going to be the ninth overall player you're expecting at ninth overall. But that's not his fault. That's Ken Holland's fault. So I, I think for, for what he became, and if you've seen the videos of him recently, he's slimmed down even more. He looks ready to go. And I'm, I'm excited for Michael Rasmussen. There's people buying Michael Rasmussen jerseys. So that's, I mean, mm-hmm. that's something. People are excited for Michael Rasmussen. I think the thing about Rasmussen, no, I don't think he was ever going to be the ninth best player in that draft class. But I do think that, that the, the path of development was kind of screwed up for him where he had to come yeah. to the NHL first and then at turn, what, turn 20 and then, then go, go back to Grand to the Rapids. NHL. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, I guess you could have left them in juniors for one more year and then brought them to the AHL. But, uh, you know, I, that, that regime obviously kind of screwed up his development, but also screwed up the pick. Yeah. I mean, screwed up is, is a, is a tough term. I, I like Michael Rasmussen for what he does. You could have, could you have gotten better people in that position? Absolutely, you guys. Could have traded after... down, got Rasmussen, and got somebody sure. else. I mean, but guys no, that went after Ken Rasmussen. Holland. Uh, Martin Neches went after Michael Rasmussen. Cal Foot, uh, Nick Suzuki, Timothy oh, Lilgren. The mm. Suzuki one hurts. Philip Heedle, Kyler Yamamoto. Uh, I mean, even if you go down twenty six, Jake Ottinger. Mm. So no, there... nothing is worse than what Boston did. I think it was 20, exactly. 2018 or whatever, where they had the three first in a row. And then after that, Barzell went and and who was it? Barzell, Shabbat, Shabbat and a couple other guys. Yeah, uh, Boston took, you mean the first round? I Boston wasn't... took Seneshin, uh, Zaboral, and um, DeBrusque. DeBrusque yeah. eh, the DeBrusque one worked out okay, if he doesn't want out still. I guess he rescinded that. That's what yeah. Saying. Um, so I think we have some more Anyways. user user questions and listener questions. Uh, do we want to start with your questions or ours? 
Um, it's your guys' show. Let's start with yours. All right. From Jimmy St. Dennis on Twitter at James St. Dennis. As a small YouTuber, I admire your work and how, uh, and also how do you get your ideas for your videos? Um, a lot of like, I'm at the point now where I feel like I redo a lot of videos that I did like years ago. Like say every off season, I'll make a video where I try to predict players that are going to break out in the following seasons, just stuff like that. Um, you know, leading into drafts, we'll do mock drafts. Um, every so often I like to revisit, um, redrafting as well, I think is a lot of fun. It know, is looking back yeah, it is. Um, as a Red Wings fan, you know, from like 2014 to 2018, it's not as fun, but no, it's not, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, just stuff like that. And, you know, if something happens in the sports world, I'm always thinking, you know, how could I translate that to the NHL or did something like that ever happen in the NHL? So I just having an open mind too. Yeah, I like a lot. Of, I like that a lot of your content goes across the board. And like I said, you cover all the teams, but it's easier that way, I think, to say, hey, and especially in the off season because there's moves happening all the time, you're probably going to go record a video about David Krejci tomorrow and you've got content there. So it's a heavy news season for you constantly because you cover all the teams. So I, there's I mean, there's got to be constant amount of ideas out there. Oh, yeah. And I mean, it was especially exciting because we had like, you know, the NBA off season is always so crazy, but like, I feel like the NHL is kind of getting there. Like last off season where we had the expansion draft, there was a yep. ton of trades. I remember on draft day, there was, I think I made like five videos and every single trade um, was like significant names were involved. And then obviously we had, you know, Huberto and Uyghur for Kachuk and like that. That's like one of the, I don't think that's just one of the biggest like trades recently. Like that might be one of the biggest trades of all time, like two 100 point players getting yeah. traded for each other mm-hmm. and then you have like a top 20 defenseman in Uyghur like that's a massive trade um so yeah it was definitely it was an exciting off season and I mean we still have guys like Kadri still a free agent um there's some there's some names available still yeah and I think it'll only get crazier too once the cap starts going up because we've had flat cap for so long it's gonna probably be another year and then you're gonna get those maybe three million dollar or three million dollar a year cap increases where teams can just do more crazy stuff because they're going to have more room. And I, I think like that's all these trade deadlines and, and like off seasons are trying to one up each other though, because yep. you had the NFL off season that was insane. Then you had the NBA off season, the NHL, and then the MLB trade deadline was insane as well. So, well, I think that's what needs to happen is the NHL, <laughs> the NHL well wanting to make itself more relevant is consistently shooting itself in the foot. <laughs> um, but that's what need. That's one thing that needs to happen. Like you said, that the the NBA off seasons are crazy because they're just the stars are going left and right. Dudes are hitting free agency that should never hit free agency, and there's just big names going all over the place. The NHL needs some kind of hype thing like that, and the All Star break ain't doing it. So they need yeah. to to come up with a way to make these like owners need to start move not being afraid to move big pieces. But again, in in basketball, one guy can change your entire team. Exactly. In yeah. hockey, it's so much harder to do that. Well, one thing I feel like I wish these happened more, but like offer sheets, I feel like there's so much potential there. Yeah. But I don't I mean, I don't just want to say like GMs are like cowards, but I feel like that's kind of what it is. Like they don't want to ruin relationships. Yeah. I mean, your goal is to make your team as best as you possibly can, like. And yeah, like if you sign a guy to like a 10 million plus offer sheet, what is it? Four first round picks. But it's, if yeah, you're a good team, insane. if you're a good team, those picks are going to be in the twenties. Um, and there's no guarantee. Even if you have a lottery pick that you're going to draft a player who's even going to make the NHL, you know, you could draft a Michael Rasmussen, you could draft, you know, an Evgeny Sveshnikov with like a pick in the twenties. So I really wish offer sheets happen more often. Um, but I don't think that's something that's going to happen until maybe, like a new wave of general managers start to come into the NHL. Cause I feel like also when a team has a GM opening, they kind of just recycle through guys that have already been GMs in the league before. Yep. Yeah. That's what we had kind of talked about when the Red Wing search was on, we were like, I hope that coaching doesn't get recycled. Same thing with general managers is you hope when a general manager gets fired that you don't pick up an old one or one that's been around and but I think offer sheets could make a comeback. We were talking last week about maybe there, maybe Montreal is going to be in some trouble and maybe we can get an offer sheet in there. I, what was our trade? 
uh, Tyler, what was our, our trade for Montreal? They wanted to get PK Subban. They're yeah. apparently looking at PK. This Subban. one was insane. Yeah. I so was... I said that, and I think the hockey writers had said maybe Mike Hoffman, Detroit could take Mike Hoffman's contract mm-hmm. so they could sign Subban. So we could take the Hoffman contract. They could sign Subban. They're not going to have any money left. And then, so we, then we just go ahead Kirby and offer Doc. sheet Kirby Doc. <laughs> Pretty and, crazy that Montreal's in a cap situation, considering you know where they're at as a team, <laughs> right? They, they like Ken Holland special. They've got two hundred and forty-eight thousand dollars right now. Uh, <laughs> how does that and, even happen? Uh, they do have Jonathan Druins on IR. I'm not sure for how long. That's five point five million there. He was playing in a street hockey game the other day, so I'm assuming he's not going to be on IR for that much longer. Okay. So how that happens is you have Nick Suzuki at a seven point eight seven five. You've got Brendan Gallagher at a 6.5. You've got Josh Anderson at 5.5. Yeah, the uh, Anderson one is tough. You've got Carey Price at 10.5. There you um, go. Now, is Carey Price going to play next season? That's another question. I don't think so. If he doesn't play, is he going to retire? Uh, he can't go on LTIR. That If he retires, that money's not coming off. So I Why mean, can't he go on LTIR? He's not injured. He is injured. Is it bad enough to go on LTIR? I think that's what that's what he that's what they're trying to figure out at this point in time. Because he, was I, I remember Elliot counseling. Freeman on one of the last thirty-two thoughts said something about that that um, Carey Price was going to see some doctors and see if if he can still continue to play or not. You I'll can look check that Roto, up. but yeah, I mean it's that's another thing is and, and that's how they're that that screwed is that they signed a bunch of just okay. He is out with a knee injury. Mm-hmm. His estimated return is uh, September 15th. So I wonder if if he were to retire and Montreal could just trade that contract to Arizona. Uh, in June, June 24th was the last update. He underwent a small procedure on his knee. The Canadians are waiting to see how he responds to it. Kent Hughes clarified that it was not an operation that Price underwent. Those specific details. Wait. It was not an operation that he underwent. He underwent a small procedure. What the Isn't hell? Isn't that an operation? I would think so. Um, okay. But that's how they're screwed. They have high-priced dudes, Michael Matheson, their top defense, top highest paid defenseman is making 4.875. Yeah, 4.875 million for four more seasons. That was a weird trade. Even so, for Pittsburgh. I feel like that trade didn't make sense for either team. I, I, what I don't get though is like they're they were bottom like basement. They, if your basement had three levels, they're on the bottom, and they have got two hundred and forty eight thousand dollars in cap space. Well, so, I, I saw a chart the other day saying that they have the least efficient use of cap uh, cap hits <laughs> in the NHL, and it's like, yeah, no shit. <laughs> it's not going well for them. Uh, the next listener question from Major Nelson at Major Nelson 16 on Twitter. What assets are acceptable losses if it means acquiring Matt Barzal? Well, I feel like I'll, I feel like the most obvious centerpiece would be Tyler Bertuzzi. I do too. Um, I feel like, you know, maybe a Jonathan Bergen is thrown in there as well. I don't, I mean, I feel like, would you guys be comfortable trading like first round picks at this point? I know in the past, like obviously Detroit was always, you know, there's potential that could be the number one overall pick, but I, I really don't think there's much so of a this chance. Season, it would be this I season. don't think it would be. Yeah. Um, if you're trading a first and a prospect for a Barzell or a first and a couple prospects or a first, a roster player and a prospect, I think that's okay. I um, now I have a question about that though. You bring Barzell in. You move cop to the wing. He has, he has, yeah, he has no, uh, that's not my question. He has set one year left at 7 million per, or, mm-hmm. you know, 7, 7 million for this season. And then he's an RFA. Is that insurance in case Larkin walks in free agency? I don't think the two would be connected. He's an arbitration eligible RFA. I mean, you could, and it depends on how his season does. When you look at Matt Barzell, and I was looking at his chart the other day. He, and I'm not sure if it's play style and, and how he would do now under Elaine Lambert, but he has stead- his stats and, and play have declined. Now, decline makes it sound like it's been really bad, but it hasn't. But he has not progressed the past three seasons. 
he has steadily gone down the past three seasons. And that's yeah. why I said, if you're, if you're trading a Bertuzzi for him, Bertuzzi's gotten better. Bertuzzi helps, uh, helps the Islanders with something like a playoff push, adds grit to their team, adds scoring to their team. So I think that if Bertuzzi was a centerpiece in a Barzal trade, and because they want to sign Kadri, they've got 11 million in cap space left. Um, Kadri is probably going to get around eight, five, if he signs a seven year deal, they got to move something out. So in, in Kadri's a center. Could you imagine a Kadri Bertuzzi on the same line? I wouldn't want to play against them. No, not at all. I, <laughs> oh you're dead. God. You're dead. And that would and be their first line, line, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I I'd think imagine. So. Because right now, who's their top center? Is, is Barzal playing their top line right now? Yeah. I know he was shuffled around last season. I mean, I remember they had him on the third line at one point. But yeah. I, I'm a big Barzal believer. Like in his first season, um, I think he had what, 85 points, something around that. Um, and that was the only season he played not under Barry Trotz. Um, but obviously, Barry Trotz is a great coach. But I feel like you can only unlock so much of his offensive potential when you're playing, you know, in a Barry Trotz system. Obviously, yeah, you're playing trap hockey. Exactly. So, but now I feel like Marzell, I'm sure he probably picked up a lot of good defensive habits those years playing under Barry Trotz. So I think if he puts everything together, like if that's a center who can be responsible two ways, be like a 75 to 80 point guy, I mean, imagine having him and Larkin as your one two punch down the oh. middle. That would be pretty awesome. Now, does Lane Lambert, though, open up his? open up his offense. I mean, like you said, in 2017, 18, he had 22 goals and 63 assists for 85 points this past season in 73 games. He had 59 points. He went from a minus two player to a minus 15. I hate plus minus, but that's what it is. It's if your one, two punch is Larkin Barzal and you move cop to the wing and your third line center ends up becoming like a Joe Valeno. I mean, it's, that's rough for opposing teams because Barzal is with the puck. He's extremely efficient. Oh yeah. He's, he's a, one of the best possession guys in the league. Like yeah, he can just wheel around the offensive zone. He's so good at making others around him better. Like imagine him on a line, you know, with a sniper or like a Lucas Raymond, obviously, um, or a guy like Phillips Adina, if he, you know, develops into, maybe that's a guy who could unlock his game a little bit. But imagine like a it. Barzal Verona Peron. Yeah, or like a Barzal Verona cop. Yeah, that's as your second line, or that could even be their first. It'd kind of be like a 1A, 1B thing, probably. Yeah, I mean, that's something I think. And again, Iserman's got time to make moves. But I think as, as far as acceptable losses, if it means acquiring him, I think you could give up. If, if, you, if they're going to be as good as we think they can be this next season, I don't think a first round picks out of the question. I don't exactly. think a Tyler Bertuzzi is out of the question. I don't think a good prospect like a Berggren is out of the question because of what you're getting in return. Yeah, but you're not giving up all three of those. No, not all three, but those are acceptable losses if they are included in packages with Barzal as the return. So you're saying Bertuzzi and a first for Barzal? No, no. Or no? No. Uh, I think Bertuzzi and Barzal, I think if you had to give up a pick with Bertuzzi, because it depends on how you see... If I are, are the Islanders trading from a position of they need to trade him to sign a cadre. Well, yeah, I guess they wouldn't have any leverage in that situation, but yeah. So maybe you're doing a one for one for Tuzi for Barzal, or maybe you're doing um, a, a Bertuzzi in a, in a mid round pick for a Barzal. So like a, a lower prospect. Sure. If you got a, say if you're the Ribbons GM and you get a call right now, Bertuzzi and the 2023 first round pick, you're not saying yes for Barzell? I don't think so. No? And if I'm Iserman, I don't think I'm doing that. Ooh. I think if I'm See, Iserman, I think I'm saying yes because it because it he's still an RFA and there's still an opportunity with the cap going up that you could lock up for two or sorry, you could lock up Barzell and Larkin long term, and then that's your one two punch up the middle. And see, I thought Barzell was 23. Three or I thought he was 24. He turned 25 in May. So he's two years younger than Tyler Bertuzzi. So you're getting younger there. I mean, it's I think it's tough because, like you said, that that pick is probably going to be in the high teens yeah. or low 20s. It's still technically a lottery pick, but we know how the Red Wings and the lottery are not friends. So exactly. <sighs> what watch though, the one year they do trade, yeah, right. Well, okay. Win the lottery. 
would would it be Bertuzzi in a lottery protected or top 10 protected first, first round, round pick, pick. then yeah. I'd probably feel better. Yeah. But this is also an extremely deep draft coming up. So yeah, you're not wrong. Uh, next question from constrictor at constrictor 14. What are your non hockey sport fandoms? If you have any, uh, I'm a big Raptors fan in the NBA. Um, I started following the blue Jays a significant amount this season as well. So I would say those are my other two, but the Raptors, especially. All right. Who scores the most, uh, most goals this season on the red wings? Nope. In general. Oh, uh, Matthews, uh, most assists, most assists. I'm going to say Huberto and most points overall. Um, I don't want to say McDavid cause that's boring, but, <laughs> but McDavid, McDavid cause exactly. It's like, yeah. <laughs> For the Red Wings though, I'm going to say most goals, Red Wings. I'd say, I think it'll be Jacob Rana. If he stays okay. healthy, do you think he hits 30? I think he could be pushing 40. See, that's what some so big D energy today. Someone was yelling profusely in the comments uh, <laughs> that he was going to be a 40 plus goal scorer this season. I wouldn't say 40 plus, but like I think he could be like 36, 37. I think so too. Like I think Lucas Raymond could hit, uh, should hit 30 goals this season. Yeah. They just and, have so many more weapons. Like Peron's a guy who can score 30. Kubelik has scored 30. Um, Larkin has scored 30. There's so many fun storylines going into next season that they're just, we just haven't had. It's exciting. Yeah. Uh, now we have your questions. Uh, okay. Do you want me to read them or you want to read them? Uh, yeah, you can go ahead. Okay. From Layton, if you had to get... Oh, God, I hate this. <laughs> if you had to get rid of one, one guy, would you get rid of Casper, Edvinson, or Raymond? It says Casper is younger, could be better than both of them. I don't think so. Edvinson is looking like he's going to be an unreal defenseman. Raymond has proven himself, but the others could be even better. Um, first, I'd like to say I hate you. Uh, second, mm. I to, to make me feel good, I would say Casper, because uh, if, if you've listened to anything Tony Ferrari says uh, from the Hockey News, um, he is a prospect analysis guy, Sports Illustrated Hockey News, and Casper is very good, but Casper, like he said, he doesn't think Casper is going to be a guy that challenges for a one C spot. He thinks Casper is an NHL player. Casper is going to be an extremely good second line center. He is a center and that's what you're getting in him. And he's probably going to have extremely long NHL career, but he's not going to be that elite type guy. So my answer would be Casper. Yeah. My answer would be Casper as well, just because you know, damn well what Lucas Raymond is and where his game is and where it's going to be. He, he is going to be 35, 40 goal scorer, I think. Mitch Marner? 60, uh, probably 70, 80 points per season, somewhere around there. So, I mean, and then Edvinson, I mean, he's a six foot five defenseman that shoots left. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's not an easy question whatsoever. <laughs> and I absolutely hate Leighton for asking this. <laughs> but, no, I mean, yeah, it's it's got to be Casper. I agree with you guys on that. I think, I think it just has to be. Yeah, without even seeing him play a game. And that's the whole thing. That's what I think makes it a little harder. Is yeah. you've never seen Casper play an NHL. Now, granted, you haven't seen Edmondson play an NHL game either, but you saw what he did in the SHL. And Casper's in Rogla now, and we'll see what he does with William Wallander and Theodore Niederbox. You got good guys over there for him to play with, but without even Edvinson's uh, brief stint in the World Juniors before they got shut down, like he was doing, like he had a shorthanded breakaway goal <laughs> as a defenseman, as a huge defense. <laughs> yeah, like, so his his skill set, like I think, like a him and Sider pairing in the future is just oh. like I think that could be the best pairing in the league one day. That could be one of the best pairings the league has seen in a very long time. I mean, just in general. Yeah. I think, and we had stated, I think Moritz Seider is already a top 10 defenseman. And when you put Edvinson, who I think, and you, I think I saw, was looking through your video titles recently, guys who could challenge for the Calder next season. And I think Edvinson's one of those guys. Yep. Yeah. I, if you have, if you have Seider win as a defenseman, 
uh, the Calder and then have Edvinson come in and win the Calder as a defenseman. You, I mean, Steve Eiserman gets a lifetime ticket to run this team. Exactly. Imagine a guy <laughs> like Jonathan Bergen wins the Calder out of nowhere. Oh, now he's one of my dark horses. I mean, a yeah. guy who's almost at a point per game pace in the AHL and yeah, with he's the one hands of the that he's got scores in the league down there. Yep. His I hands are dark insane. horse for me to win the, the, uh, the Calder in the league is Kent Johnson. I like him a lot. Yeah. Kent's good. Uh, Not because and... he went to Michigan, just because I, I, I think he is a good player. <laughs> but also, because and I think he went Columbus to is going to get a little bit better with Gaudreau. Yeah. Oh, well, I think they'll get a lot better with Gaudreau. I that that move didn't make a ton of sense to me because it's not like Columbus is knocking on the door. But after listening to what Gaudreau said, and it's more of a family decision, want to move back to the states. He still could have went to Jersey. I don't know why he didn't go to Jersey. Yeah, but I, I mean, I feel like if. If you have a position to sign a guy like Gaudreau, who like he just had an MVP caliber season, I feel like no matter if you're rebuilding this, that, I feel like you kind of have to do it. Yeah, I would agree. And before we go, I mean, we'll just revisit this one before we go. Uh, Thomas Bork did ask Zadina's future. I think he sticks around. Um, I, he, if you trade him, you're getting nothing for him. That's the problem. His trade value is so low right now that it makes no sense to trade him. Uh, exactly. Derek Lalone did say that he thinks Zadina is a guy the kind of guy that could do with a coaching change. Maybe that will help his game. Uh, I like Lalone's kind of approach to what he says he does with players. He treats them all differently depending on how they respond. So maybe there's mm-hmm. going to be a little bit of that there uh, with Zadina. And I think that if Zadina can open himself up to finding different ways to score instead of just trying to do a one-timer every time, He's yeah. got the other tools. He needs to tighten up his defense a little bit, but the tools are there for him to be successful. And I would like to see Zadina at least get, I don't know, 15 goals next season. If Rasmussen can score 15 goals, Zadina should be Absolutely. able to do it in his sleep. Absolutely. And he, Zadina is probably, he's the guy I'm probably most excited for when it comes to this coaching change. I think he needed it the most. Um, and also like now Detroit's a lot stronger on the wing. They have a lot more weapons. Like there shouldn't be really any pressure on him to do anything night in night out. Like I feel like anything you get from a Zadina at this point is like a bonus as to where, yeah. you know, the past couple of seasons we're like, Oh, Zadina hasn't scored in 10 games. Um, but now you have guys like David Perron who are going to be able to make up for a lot of that Kubalik as well. Andrew cop. So yeah, I think there's a lot less pressure on him too, which should hopefully help. Tyler, what do you want out of a Zadina? I, so here's my thing. I, I think that Zadina has, potential to break out this year if he's put with the right guys and and you know allowed to get some chemistry because I feel like the biggest issue with Zadina is lack of chemistry and then obviously we we talked about this at nauseum confidence the, the, you know the, the confidence goes away you see that with young players and then you know their game goes to hell and so that's kind of where where he's at I think he'll have a fresh start I think he I think he could push 20 goals this year. I, I think he could push 25 goals if he gets in the right situation. I, I think he's staying because uh, like what you said, I don't I don't think they're gonna get much for him. I mean, unless you can get Matt Barzell and, and trade um Bertuzzi and Zadina together, and that's all you have to give up for Barzell, I would do that. But um yeah, I think he'll be here. The confidence thing is, yeah, I think that's the biggest. And mm-hmm. I think that goes back to coaching. Like Zeno, he'd find himself maybe in the top six for once, but then it feels like he had just such such a short leash, which yep. didn't really ever make sense to me considering nope. where Detroit was at. Like, I feel like you should, obviously you don't just want them out there, you know, being lazy, this, that, but like one mistake. And then next, you know, he's benched. Next game he's on the fourth line. He's just all over the place. So it would have been hard to get going for anybody in that kind of situation. Yeah, the Blash Hill Blender was not kind to Philip Zadina. <laughs> no. and just Blash himself was not super nice to Philip Zadina, and that had to kind of hurt his confidence a little bit. Um, exactly. But is there anything you want to plug before we sign out tonight? How people can find you, what you're working on? Um, well, just my YouTube channel is Onyquist. I cover pretty much every team in the league. Um, you know, maybe some teams more than other. Like, I'll talk about the Red Wings more than the Arizona Coyotes, of course, but uh-huh. I talk about everything. Um, Twitter is the same. Pretty much all my social medias are just Onyquist. So, yep. Cool. Tyler, final thoughts before we sign off? Yeah, final thoughts. I mean, we're getting close to go time here. I know a lot of people are fans of, of other sports and stuff. Baseball is starting to get to 
the the pennant pushes and the world junior starts tomorrow which should be interesting Oof, very excited wings um, have a lot of prospects in the world juniors i called the world juniors the the snack i call um college football and the nfl starting the appetizer and then i call <laughs> the uh the nhl season starting the 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 five course meal so i don't know i'm looking forward to it i think i think the wings will be much better and i think it, it'll keep people's attention a lot longer. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at SealDog91. My final thoughts are going to be thank you, Nyquist, for coming and on and chatting with us tonight. Uh, we'd love to have you back on kind of as the season goes, maybe mid-season, uh, just to kind of reflect on what's happening. And maybe if there are any other crazy moves, uh, we'll have you back on to discuss. Um, but yeah, for sure, go check out his channel on YouTube. Uh, your subscriber count is nuts, um, but you have a lot of good content. <laughs> yeah, you have this a lot of the first of good... time I've actually ever been on a podcast. So that's surprising. Really? Yeah. Um, yeah. I had fun. Yeah. Anytime, guys. Thanks well, for having me. You did great. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, you can follow me online at Bringing the Wing. You can follow the Grindline Podcast online at Grindline Pod. We like to give a shout out to the Hockey Podcast Network at Hockey Podnet on Twitter for hosting us and spreading us around. Uh, you can use the promo code GRINDLINE on Bring Hockey Back to get 12% off your order. You can use that same promo code on Howie's Hockey Tape to get 10% off your order. And if you use the promo code GRINDLINE on Manscaped.com, you will get 20% off your order plus free shipping. We also like to give a shout out to Vintage Detroit, which is the only place you should get your Detroit jerseys. We're going to do some cool stuff with them coming up. They're actually going to start selling our t-shirts and distributing them in stores. So if you go somewhere like a fanatic, you, you'll probably find our shirts pretty soon. And uh, we also like to give a shout out to our merch shop. If you go to redbubble.com and search the grind line, you can find our t-shirts there. Uh, pick them up. If you pick up the Vladimir Konstantinov beat them shirt, hundred percent of the proceeds go to the Vladimir Konstantinov special needs trust, but that is going to do it for us tonight. So for Tyler, I am Greg. You stay classy. Hockey down.